All right, guys, so one thing we've talked about is we can complete the square for any quadratic. That's something that we cannot do for factoring. So when we want to look into solving a quadratic equation, two of the processes that we look into is factoring and completing the square. Now, factoring is great because it is efficient. And if you have a quadratic that is factorable, I think factoring is going to be the best way. But completing the square is something we can do for any other equation. Now, in my previous videos on this series of quadratics, what we've noticed, though, is using inverse operations and completing the square can go from easy to pretty difficult problems. So is there another technique that we can apply that we can satisfy for all quadratics? And when I'm talking about all quadratics, I'm talking about quadratics that are in the form of ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. Because if you remember, when looking into this form, factoring can be difficult when we have an a. Even completing the square can be difficult when we have an a. So if there is a faster and easier method when we have an a, what exactly is it? Well, in this video, what I want to do is think through that process. And the way that we can do that is actually to apply completing the square to this problem. Problem. Because remember, we can complete the square for any quadratic. So let's just treat this like any other quadratic. The first thing I would do if I was going to complete the square is I would get my C to the other side. Therefore, I have an AX squared plus ABX is equal to C. Now, the next thing, remember, we can't have this A right here. If we're going to create a perfect square trinomial, we can only do it when A is equal to 1. So one of the techniques I worked on in the last video was to go ahead and divide everything by A. Now, when I divide everything by a, I now get the equation of x squared plus b over ax equals ac over a. Now we have something we can create the square with. Now, again, we previously used c, and c could, might be a little deceiving because we already have a variable here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to use a question mark because what we want to do is find what is the value that is going to create the perfect square trinomial. So I'm just going to use a little question mark. And remember, whatever we do on the left-hand side, we have to do on the right-hand side. Now, if you remember the relationship of our perfect square trinomial, that is going to be our middle term divided by 2 quantity squared. I don't want to use the b divided by 2 quantity squared because I don't want to confuse those formulas we use for a general equation with this specific example. So what I'll do is I'll take my question mark and say that is going to be my middle term, right, divided by 2 quantity squared. Now, again, remember when we have a fraction, right, divided by a number, what we want to simply do is get rid of this denominator. So the way I can do that is multiply by its reciprocal on the top and the bottom, right? Because remember, anything multiplied by its reciprocal is just going to go to 1. So therefore, this becomes a b over a 2a. Now, again, we still have to square this. So when I go ahead and take a b divided by a 2a quantity squared, that's going to give me a b squared over a 4a squared. Now, again, remember, that's what I'm going to add to both sides. Now we've added our value that has completed the square. So now this is a perfect square trinomial. I know it looks pretty crazy as a perfect square trinomial, but there's an easy way that we looked at the relationship between how to factor down when we have a perfect square trinomial compared to a binomial squared. So the signs, remember, are going to same. If this is positive, then my binomial squared is positive. What we want to do for our last term is just divide it by two, right? And again, I don't want to confuse you with the b over two for that example. If you remember when completing the square, what we looked at is if c was b divided by two quantity squared, a was just simply a b divided by 2. And we already did that, right? We took our middle term, divided it by 2. That is going to be our value for our binomial squared. So we can say that b divided by 2a is going to be your middle term divided by 2. Okay, now on the right-hand side, basically what I got to do is I got to get common denominators, right? I got to be able to figure out if I'm going to add these, they have to have the same denominator. If this is a 4a squared and this is an a, then to get common denominators, I need to multiply by a 4a over a 4a. Okay, when I do that, I get a 4ac plus b squared. Now you can see I have one variable x, right? And I can just use my inverse operations. So I go ahead and take the square to both sides and I get an x plus a b divided by 2a is equal to plus or minus. Now, again, if you're familiar with this formula, you might recognize that I can rewrite the b squared first, which is a b squared plus. That's not a plus. It's supposed to be a minus, right? Where did I make my mistake? I made my mistake up here, right? Remember when you are, when I subtracted the ca to the other side, that should have been a negative. So I made a mistake all the way back up there. So let's just go and fix this up. So that should be a negative in that case. So therefore, it's a b squared minus a 4ac. And therefore, that's going to be all over a 2a, right? Because what's the square root of 4 is 2. Square root of a squared is going to be an a. Now I can just subtract my b over 2a. And ladies and gentlemen, I now have a formula that I can find any solution to any quadratic. And rightfully so, this formula is called 
the quadratic formula. Now, there's a couple things I want you to know about this formula before we go through an example of how to apply it. The first thing, the quadratic formula can be used to solve any quadratic equation. Simply identify your a, b, and c, then plug them into the equation. But just remember that factoring and completing the square is still sometimes going to be much easier and more efficient than actually using this formula. So we'll come with some practice on when you should use each technique. Now, some mistakes students make when they're solving with the quadratic formula is they don't set the quadratic equal to zero. Again, this kind of stems from when the teacher is trying to trick you, or if you don't have a quadratic already equal to zero, you got to make sure you get everything over to the same side because this formula only works when ax squared plus bx plus c is equal to zero. Then you can identify your a, b, and c. But if you have terms on different sides of the equations, or maybe you need to expand something before you can actually apply the formula, then make sure you do that. So therefore it's in this form before applying the formula. Now, the coolest thing that I like about the quadratic formula is this thing right here. This is what we call the discriminant. And there's some actually really important things that I want you to remember about identifying the discriminant. Because without actually solving a solution, you can use the discriminant to understand what type of solutions your quadratic equation is going to have. So when your discriminant is equal to zero, what that tells you is actually that you're going to have only one solution, which is going to be repeated. On a graphical approach, that basically means your vertex is going to be touching the x-axis. You're only going to have one real solution. Now, when b squared minus 4 times ec is equal to a square number, like 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, any number that you can take the square root of, then you're going to have two real solutions rational roots. And those are always nice because like the first example, when it's equal to zero, that actually gives you a quadratic that would be factorable. So not saying you shouldn't do the quadratic formula on those, but factoring typically is going to be an easier process when solving those. But again, whatever you need to do to solve a quadratic, do it. Now, if your discriminant is still positive, but they're not square numbers like five or seven, then you're going to have two real irrational roots. Irrational is going to be, you're not going to be able to rewrite them as a fraction. So a discriminant that you cannot take the square root of. Now, lastly, if your discriminant is going to be less than zero, hopefully you recognize you cannot take the square root of a negative number. So therefore you're going to have no real roots. Now, obviously, depending on the class and where you're at, you can also talk about your imaginary solutions. But if you're looking at this as a graphical approach, basically the quadratic is not going to cross the x-axis. So for this video, I'm just going to keep this as no real roots. So I would like to go through at least one example of using the quadratic formula since we spent so much time identifying it. So if you look at this example and you tried to factor it, you'd recognize that this problem is not very easy to factor. Actually, it's not going to be factorable across real rational roots. So you might immediately try to look at this by completing the square. And actually in the last video, that's exactly what I did. While it was definitely something we did, it wasn't the easiest of operations that we could have done. Let's go and tackle this using the quadratic formula. Remember, the quadratic formula only works when our equation is in the form of ax squared plus b x plus c is equal to zero. If anything was on the right hand side or equal to it, we'd have to make sure we got them all to the same side equal to zero. It's like when we use factoring, remember the zero product property only works when our product is equal to zero. Well, this is going to be the exact same case. So now that we have our quadratic equal to zero, now what I want to do is I just identify my a, b, and my c. So a is going to be two. That's the coefficient of your quadratic term. B is equal to seven, which is the coefficient of my linear term. And c is equal to a negative 20, which is my constant. Now, basically all I'm going to do is plug them into my quadratic formula. And remember the quadratic formula is x equals opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c, and this is all over 2 times a. You might have heard some kind of song to help you remember this, but my thought process is if you practice this enough and enough, you will remember this formula as well as how to simplify it. So now we're just going to plug things in. So what I have here is a negative 7. Now again, I, whenever I'm plugging things in, I like to use parentheses. That is just a mental reminder for me that I replaced a variable with a number. So I have a negative 7 plus or minus the square root here. This is going to be a 7 quantity squared minus a four times two times C, which is a negative 20. All right, and that's gonna be all over here, a two times A, which in this case is going to be a two. Now you could go ahead and find the discriminant if you are curious of what type of solutions they were. But in this case, we just want to be able to solve the equations. Now again, remember this is all equal to my X. So I have a negative seven plus or minus, let's go ahead and simplify this. Seven squared is going to be a 49. Now here, sometimes students can make mistakes. So just kind of be careful with this. This is negative four times two times negative 20, which is going to be a positive 160. And this is going to be all e over a four. So now I just have a negative 7 plus or minus 49 plus 160 is going to be the square root of 209 all over 4. So again, going to my understanding of the discriminant, it's not 0, right? So I don't have one solution. 209 is not a square number, so I don't have two real rational roots. It's not a negative number, so I do have a real root. 
But since it is a not a square number, it's a non-square number. So that means I'm going to have two real irrational roots. Now you can leave our answer just like this, or we could distribute the four into both of them. So I could rewrite this as a negative seven over four plus or minus a one fourth times the square root of 209. It really just kind of depends on how your teacher or the test wants your solution to be written. But hopefully you recognize from comparing this to trying to factor it compared to completing the square, this was much easier and much faster. However, deciding when to use the quadratic formula and when not to use the quadratic formula can be difficult. So make sure you check out my next video on my best tips that I can give you for solving quadratic equations. I'll see you guys there. Cheers.